Campus Artist Agency uh, in constructing possibilities to really to, to form, uh, explore these ideas. Uh, I'm going to go to the video and then going to return. Six minutes. I know, it's hard. So, Yema ya hace Padre, Hijo y Espíritu Santo. Yema ya hace su. Yema ya me levó. Ache. There's more water than there. And Yema ya raised the water. We celebrate a carriage, mother of all of us, who kicked the door and let the people in. Yema ya. Mother of all of all, celebrate this building. Celebrate this day. Today, April 27th, year 2014. So this part is important. to see the work of Sister Carrie.
She suffered and she has shared black tears, blacker than blacker, deepest blue that is the blue in the ocean. And she hoped for a long time, it's time to unleash the power. Oh, me, oh, Oshun, Oshun, sweet sister of Yemaya. Oshun, diosa de la dulzura y del amor. Oshun, dueña de la fertilidad y del placer. Hermana de Yemaya, sweet goddess, sweet goddess, here is a gift from Yemaya and Oshun for your journey in the future. Ashe! 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 Thank you. <laughs>So the importance of that piece is that this was the very first time in the history of the Guggenheim Museum that a show of a black woman took place. That was in the context of the exhi personal exhibition of Carrie Mae Wins, and she invited me to be one of the performers. First time in the history of the Guggenheim Museum that a black woman is invited for a solo show. So, talking about art and democracy and justice. In the second decade of the 21st century, what questions may an artist ask as a possible inquiry on the health and the status of both democracy and justice and the practice of art? Could art, as a keeper of the pulse of the time, compel societal responses that effectively and tentatively restore democratic exercise and deliver of justice as collective aspiration. I could not think of a more fitting circumstances to risk ourselves in a discussion of art, democracy, and justice than our present moment. I walk into this dialogue, dialogue from a position of optimism and guided by the power of love. With profound conviction that art, yes, is a key keeper in the trilogy of art, democracy, and justice. I choose a triptych as a visual format to introduce this conversation. Because art, as a triptych itself, do pull and push and fold within itself the boundaries of democracy and justice, the ages of what is permissible by canon, acceptable by society, and imaginable by our time, by makers and viewers. Because as we have learned from our collective stories, artists raise their voices in times when democracy may reach fault lines, that artists will use the tool at their disposal to fight bad bigotry and abuse in any form it manifests. Art witnesses and inscribes what falls not only in society at the present time, but it projects path of futures unseen, all revealed by the sheer beauty and power of artistic language and form with endless aesthetics outpours. I will think that I want to move the conversation beyond good or bad art as have we known in the 20th century and in the beginning of the century, 21st. Assuming that the present time requires new etymological grounds to define what do we perceive and experience as an artistic reach. I am in reverie of the magnanimous capacity of love the power of art and the practice of democracy and justice is that what allowed me today, a black, Latino, Asian, Cuban, immigrant woman, to reach you all here in Nashville and elsewhere to launch a conversation between friends that may help us together articulate ideas 
toward a richer context for art teaching, for art practice, and living with art, opening to the possibility of a future of this trilogy, art, democracy, and justice. I'm going to ask my student in the second row to stand up and face the audience. Thank you, guys. What could an artist say in a world as unbalanced as ours is today? What are the spaces that we could still access? What are the territories open to be transformed by imagination and creativity? What is there to conquer? How could we, all artists, help protecting our fragile planet? What are the language that may allow us to alleviate the pain in our world? Our technological progress is unparalleled at this time. We are rightly so out to discover the immensity, expansive universe in where we are just a dust particle. But yet, we may leave air unable to resolve in peace minuscule disagreements between humans. Our hearts have not grown with the same speed of our mighty technological grasp. Our capacity for empathy and sentiment is still attached to our human form from the dawn of time. We will kill for survival. But it's only through art that we could deset the feelings, the urge, of our brightest and somber instinct. Art, like democracy and justice, seek understanding of truth. And since we know that truth too is imperial right now, this dialogue is urgent and necessary across geographies, credos, and artistic voices. I'm going to invite to the podium now my first guest from the evening. Holland Cotter has been a fighter, a warrior, and a poet. Through his writing, he has described the code interpreted and revealed to us some of the most intriguing body of work, many of them from what I call other modernities. It was Holland Cotter his position as a senior writer at the New York Times, as a co-chief critic of the New York Times that introduced to America and audience around the world, art from Africa, Asia, Middle East, with grace, with a capacity to translate information in a way that was accessible for many. So I'm inviting Holland to join me in the podium to talk about art, democracy, and justice. Good evening, everybody. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, first of all, I want to thank um, Magda uh, for inviting me to Nashville. And let me just say that uh, this city and Vanderbilt University and its students, who are always the most important people in the room, and not just because they wear great t-shirts, are, are all hugely fortunate to have her as an artist and a person. An artist and a person of her brilliance and energy and just plain through and through goodness, which is, counts more than anything. Very lucky to have her in residence, you are. As you've heard, Magda and Olu agreed by both participated in Documenta 14, which was conceived and directed by Adam Shimchik and took place last year in two locations, Athens, Greece, and Kassel, Germany. I reported on the Kassel presentation for the New York Times, and I reviewed it very positively. It was a wonderful show. A few months later, I made a mention of it again in an end-of-year list of outstanding art season events. 
by which time the exhibition had encountered political blowback. I wrote in that capsule review, ambitiously diffuse, the exhibition took off in more directions than any single event, even twice its size, could handle. Anti-fascist and pro-immigrant, it attracted fury from German's right-wing press as being too, quote, political. And it was hit with accusations of overspending. Had the show been lighter, brighter, less political, and a big tourist draw, would its budget have been treated as a mortal sin? My guess is no. Among the exhibition's high points, along with a fantastic performance by Magda that explored the African sources of Cuban culture, was Olu Aguibe's sculpture, Monument for Strangers and Refugees, which was installed on the Koenig Platz at the very center of the city, near the main Documenta campus. It was a 54-foot tall concrete obelisk inscribed on four sides with a phrase taken from the Matthew Gospel of the New Testament. Quote, I was a stranger and you took me in. The words were written with gold letters in German, English, Arabic, and Turkish. When I first saw this piece, I was overcome with emotion. I was moved both by the work itself and by the context it appeared in. Adam and his team of curators had designed an exhibition that, unusually for Documenta in my experience, encompassed the whole city of Kassel, reaching into sections of the city that were largely home to non-German immigrants. And Monument for Strangers and Refugees became the geographic and conceptual linchpin of the entire exhibition, a great radiant beacon that symbolically brought urban populations together and encapsulated the exhibition's spirit of generosity. I was also moved because this work of art stood in such contrast to the cultural climate that I knew as a young person in the United States. I was born in the years just after World War II. I grew up in the late 1940s and 1950s in a suburb of Boston, Massachusetts. I grew up in the Cold War era of, quote, the Red Scare, when a Republican senator from Wisconsin named Joseph McCarthy, who served in Congress from 1947 to 1957, claimed that the United States was infested with malevolent aliens, including communist spies. And he conducted a public campaign to root them out. He circulated his accusations, which were often based on fabricated evidence, through what was then the most up-to-date of social media, television. His attacks were anti-foreigner, anti-Semitic, and anti-gay. And I should mention that at this time, every state in the Union had sodomy laws on the books, which were effectively targeted at consensual sex between gay men, and could result in up to 30 years in prison, depending on the state. During these years, much of the American public seemed to buy McCarthy's message. Many elected politicians either cheered him on or were silent. Art, too, was for the most part silent or spoke only in highly coded terms. It was, I think, no coincidence that abstraction was the painting and sculptural mode favored by the market at that time. Because I, was a very, because I was very young during this time, I wasn't fully aware of what was happening. I only picked up on the mood of paranoia that poisoned the air. What I was more aware of, though I would not have been able to put a name to it, was that the America I pledged allegiance to in my classrooms was an apartheid state. When I was very young, racial segregation in public schools was still legal and was enforced. Technically, this changed with the Brown versus Board of Education ruling in 1954. Though in the schools I went to, 
de facto segregation continued unchanged. I could have read racial politics just by looking around me. As it was, I absorbed it through the mainstream news media. The same media that had given McCarthy his platform was also broadcasting or printing images of civil rights demonstrations, of civil rights demonstrators being attacked by police, of African American, African American churches being wrecked by white terrorist bombs, and of what had every appearance of being a race war in progress across the country. Again, I saw no reflection of this in art. Most of the new art I encountered in magazines that my parents had around the house was abstract. I wasn't aware of the work and, figur of the, and figurative work that was being done by politically minded artists like Charles White or of Andy Warhol, whose early torn from the, torn from the tabloid silk screens were being shown in New York but had not reached Boston. What I was getting through, uh, what I was getting though, was interesting political instruction in traditional art museums, which I started to frequent very early. I grew up in a museum going family. Our main museum was the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, the MFA. Art museums in the 1950s, which is when I started going, were not like museums today. This was before blockbusters and before museums became primary social spaces. Back then, they were often almost empty and as quiet as libraries. On Saturdays in winter, beginning when I was maybe 10 years old, my parents would drop me off at the MFA and leave me there and go about their city business. I was in the protective custody of the guards who all knew me and because I was a shy but pretty together kid, they let me go wherever I wanted to go, and I went everywhere in the museum. I got to know pretty much the whole collection, very early and very well. Egyptian mummies, John Singleton Copley portraits, Netherlandish altarpieces, and Monet landscapes, along with a handful of life-size Japanese carved wood Buddhas and bronze figures of Hindu deities in a South Asian collection that had been assembled by Ananda Kumaraswamy. I see in retrospect how valuable those self-curated museum tour tours of the collection were. No one was saying to me, look at this because it's great, but never mind that. I looked at everything. Right from the start, I got a sense of the side-by-side -side existence of all kinds of art from different eras and cultures. And most important, I got a sense of the equal value of those cultures. I think because of that immersion, no art has ever felt foreign to me in the sense of being alien and unapproachable. At the same time, there was also a lot of art I was not seeing. The MFA was what we now call an encyclopedic museum. In those days, we called it a universal museum. But it was an encyclopedia of missing major volumes. There was no art from Africa apart from Egypt, which at that time wasn't really considered to be Africa. There was no art from pre-Columbian Central and South America or the Caribbean or Australia. There was no Native or North American art. For all that and most art by people of color, you had to go to ethnological museums or natural history museums where that art wasn't art. It was science some kind of other lesser thing. And it was segregated from real art, I put that in quotes, high art in a way that exactly mirrored American racial politics at that time. Of course, I couldn't have articulated any of this, positive or negative, at that time. But gradually and almost by accident, I was forming a social consciousness through the political, through the politics of personal experience. In the summer of 1964, when I was in high school, I went AWOL from home. A friend had been, in, had been sent to a reform school in Texas for committing petty crimes. And I just decided to pay him a visit to give him some moral support. He, 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 would break, he was breaking into uh, 
homes in my parents' hometown, and uh, including my parents' home, my home. <laughs> and his, it, was, it was kind of performance art. You know, he, he would break in. He didn't take anything. The whole point was to be able to get in and get out without being caught. And he succeeded for a very long time, and then, then he was nabbed and, <laughs> and sent away. Anyway, I wanted to visit him that summer. So I didn't tell my parents I was going. I scraped together some money, uh, borrowed it from friends, actually, took kind of a pass the hat kind of thing. Uh, I bought a $100 good for a year go anywhere Greyhound bus ticket, got on a bus and headed south. I had some clothes in a backpack and books in a shopping bag. I had Henry David Thoreau's transcendentalist Walden, Walt Whitman's Specimen Days, which was his account of his experiences as the equivalent of a psychiatric nurse during World War, during uh, the Civil War. He worked in, wa in Washington hospitals, Washington DC hospitals. I had Emily Dickinson's collected poems in the one volume Johnson edition, 1951 Johnson edition, and I had Jack Kerouac's On the Road. <laughs> Buses were at that time a, rel a relatively cheap mode of interstate travel. Most of my fellow passengers were working class Many were African American. When I crashed for a few nights with my cousin John Elliott, who was then a young English professor in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, I learned that that summer was, quote, Mississippi Freedom Summer, when Northern college students were coming to Mississippi to register votes. Three civil rights workers had disappeared and were feared murdered by the Ku Klux Klan or other white nationalists 